Now, a lot of us may think we know the story of the lone woman of San Nicolas Island because we've read things like this book. You know, or maybe oh, we've read some of the more popular accounts. This is Emma Hardacre's classic telling of the story from 1880 that, that's been again, uh, and is the basis for a lot of what we think the story is. Or maybe you've read some of the more scholarly works that have been done more recently. But when it comes down to it, and there are literally hundreds of articles that talk about the story, there is so much misinformation, conflicting information, and unconfirmed information in those, we don't really know what the story really is. And in fact, when I sat down and thought, thought about what do we really know about the story, it's not a whole lot. These are kind of the only points I could think of that are really have been confirmed, and we're pretty sure that these facts are true. <coughs> Everything else is subject to interpretation. Uh, and so what we've been working at here is trying to research the story and try to pin down all the pieces in between. Because most of the story is in between all these data points. These aren't all that interesting. Uh, but it's what happens in between and the circumstances and whatnot that really make it a real interesting and powerful story. And so we've kind of divvied up the story into pieces and all the presenters today have taken a little piece and have worked with that. And we have some really amazing new results to give to you today. Uh, and there's lots of other pieces we're still working on. We don't think they're developed well enough to present yet, but they will be. So the story will continue to evolve. It's not, a, not by no means a static story. It'll continue to evolve as we learn more and more. Uh, and it just really keeps getting more and more interesting as we go along, which I think you'll see today. Right. So our first presentation is going to be by Renee Villanueth, professor at Cal State Los Angeles. And Renee has been doing the excavations on the island for quite a few years, but most importantly for us, uh, the recent excavations we've done at this Tule Creek village site are, are very pertinent to the story. The, this village site was occupied in the few centuries just before historic contact, just before our story starts. And since Renee's done such a wonderful job and that's such a large kind of excavation, we have a pretty good idea now on what the people were doing, how they were living at that period in time. So when our story starts, this is kind of the context for what the natives are doing, how they're living on the island, which is a real important part of the story. Okay. Oh, I can get this here to go. Boom. Nope. Let's try that again. Boom. Our next paper is by Ryan Glenn, who is one of Renee's former students. Uh, and whenever we see depictions of the lone woman or Karana, Inevitably, she's with a dog, and dogs have always been a big part of the story. When she's found by night of her indictment, she has dogs with her. In the Island of the Blue Dolphins, she's, Karana spends killed the wild dogs. The dogs are a real important part of the story, <clears throat> but until now, we don't really know anything about these dogs. So what Ryan has done is he's, he's located a, a museum collection of dog skeletons that were excavated many years ago, and he's looked at those, and so n now he is gonna be able to tell us what kind of dogs these were, how big they were, what they look like, uh, and give us a lot more information about these wild packs of dogs that are running around the island. Then Susan Morris and Glenn Ferris and myself have been working on this rather interesting paper uh, Susan is a uh, researcher here locally. It does his, a lot of historical research, and she's been working uh, through the Park Service, uh, especially, uh, on the story. And Susan has connected us up with some of the Russian archives. As you know, the story, a big part of it, the big trigger point in the story is when the Russian fur company brings uh, Native Alaskan hunters down to San Nicolas Island to hunt otters, and there's a big altercation between the Alaskans and the Nicolaino, which is the name we use for the, the Native Islanders of San Nicolas. This has always kind of been just a story, but we have no confirmation of that. Susan has found that confirmation, and lo and behold, the incident did occur, but it's in a different year, we were told. There's a different ship and different captain involved that we were, have been told, and she has now the 
the circumstances of that, which are very, very interesting. We're going to enjoy that a lot. Oh, there we go. Then we have uh, Sarah Schwabel, who is a assistant professor at the University of South Carolina, English department, right? Got that. Um, and Sarah is looking at the Island of the Blue Dolphins itself as a piece of literature. Where does it come from? What is the basis for it? We know it's based on the true story, but it was written at a particular time with a particular set of values, and the author is trying to embed certain values in the book. And so how have, has the book been, been received over the years? And it was written for a time period, and now we're many, many decades past that. Is it still relevant today? And how should we be interpreting this today? And how should we be helping students who are reading this book understand it today? So this is a very interesting aspect of the story. Um, all right. And then once we're going to look at dogs again, a second time. You didn't have enough dogs the first time, so we're going to get you some more dogs. Uh, but Stephen James, who is a professor at Cal State Fullerton, is all the dogs that have been reported from San Nicolas Island. And he's going to talk more generally about their role in society and he's going to address this whole issue of the wild dogs. They're often predicted, uh, depicted as these packs of wild dogs roaming the island. And is that really true, uh, or is that just a nice fanciful story that's come, come up through the years? And then Susan, once again, will speak to us about another really interesting uh, story. This is, you know, part of the story is when she's brought back to Santa Barbara, she's taken to live with George Nider at his home. And the question is, okay, well, where was George Nidever's home? And I thought this would be a real simple thing to answer, and I, I did some searching and didn't find the answer, and it sounded kind of odd. That should be a well-known landmark, you would think, in Santa Barbara. Uh, and so Susan got onto that, and through a lot of uh, really intense research, has, I think, come up with the actual location. It's kind of been lost. It was known at one time, but it's been lost over the years. And so she's going to resurrect that for us and the whole story of, of how that came to be and how Nidever ended up being there. Ooh, not working too well. And the last paper will be by myself, and I will be talking about my over 20 year search for the cave where the lone woman actually lived during those 18 years. Now we've all been told that she was found in a hut, but the story also says, yeah, but she was living in a cave nearby uh, and where is that cave? There is no cave on the island, so where was that cave? And so we, I've been searching for that for a long time, and I think we found it. Uh, so with that, I think we're pretty much right on schedule.